Hello, dear listeners. My name is Rose Goldfop, and I am the creator of this audio drama. I would like to welcome you to our second season of the Wessex Dramas with an adaptation of Thomas Hardy's romantic comedy, The Hand of Ethelberta. As with all romantic comedies, her hand is in hot demand, and her choice of who to give it to is also in hot debate. So, loosen up your corsets, cosy up to the fire, and let us catch up with the drama. As Christopher returns from a walk, he sees a horse, wagonette, and coachman waiting outside of his house. Faith, his sister, rushes towards him out onto the pavement. Oh, Christopher, they want us to play for a dance at Wyndham House. Whatever our going rate is. Oh, he turns and looks up at the coachman on the wagonette. Hello. Why have you come for us, here, when there are musicians nearer to Wyndham House? Uh, one of the guests is staying at the house. Said there was to call for you, as you're a gentleman musician who had a sister who was an harpist. Which guest asks for us? A Mrs. Pantherwin, miss. Ah. She turns to Christopher with wide eyes. Then... Well, go and grab some dance music, Chris. I have my own parts here. Christmas is overtime, Ray. She smiles up at him. Christopher kisses her forehead and races off upstairs. Faith turns back to the coachman. Please could you go and give him a hand with my harp? We're on the third floor. I'll wait here with the horse. The coachman nods and starts to descend. Christopher and Faith exit a dark servant's passage into a dizzying, brightly lit saloon. The footman conducting them shows them along the wall to a raised dais, which has a trellis of ivy and green boughs woven through it, so as to form a screen. On the dais is a grand piano, and two other footmen follow behind, bringing Faith's harp. Christopher and Faith have no sooner seated themselves than the guests come tumbling and laughing into the room. There are around thirty of them. Faith leaves her harp and comes up to the screen, which is immediately next to Christopher's piano stool. Faith peers through the screen. Which one is Mrs. Petherin? The one with her skirts looped up with convolvulus flowers, dancing with that perfumed piece with high eyebrows they call Ladywell. He's an artist, apparently. The dancers form up into a line and start to look expectantly at the screened bower, so Faith hurries to her harp, opens her music, and nods to Christopher. They start playing. Mrs. Petherwin dances with a variety of young men and does not look at the day's screen. Finally, she snaps and, in a nearby conversational knot, takes a break from talking, discreetly to peer half behind her through the screen. She sees Christopher peering out at her and quickly looks away, embarrassed at having been caught peering. Ethelberta is asked to dance again, and she takes Ladywell's hand as the dancers start to form sets for a quadrille. During a break from the dancing, while the dancers are breaking their old sets up and slowly reforming a line, Faith leans forward, smiles and addresses Christopher. Are you remembering when you were a dance-goer instead of a dance-player? Not really, Faith. I was wondering who that little girl was whom Ethelberta... Mrs. Petherwind sent along to deliver her book to me. I believe that she's a pupil teacher, locally. I suppose we're never likely to find out. They start the music again as the dancers are looking expectantly at the dais. Christopher and Faith are being conveyed back to Sandbourne in the wagonette. They sit next to the coachman, and Christopher is talking with him. Faith suddenly points to two young women a little distance away. Look, there's one of the dancers. I think it is your acquaintance, Christopher. The lady with the red hair. Christopher looks at the two ladies, at little distance in the park. Ah, yes, Ethel, but... Mrs. Petherwin. I see the morning glory flowers on her gown. How strange to be chatting at this hour. One would have thought that she would collapse in bed after dancing all night. The coachman looks. Oh, aye. That'd be the widow, Mrs. Petherwin. She'd be wonderful. Able to talk to anyone she do, that one. A widow? Aye, and she lives with her mother-in-law in London. A widow? But she's off tomorrow. To spend New Year at Rockington. Rockington? Rockington Park, about three miles from Sanborn. The other way than this. A widow. Faith looks up at him concernedly and squeezes his arm affectionately. That makes no difference to us, does it, Christopher? Christopher smiles and raises his eyebrows. Ethelberta and Piketty are walking along. You shouldn't have come if you'd been up all night. 
I couldn't go without seeing you, Piketty. Besides, I have a couple of packages. One for you, and one for Mother. She hands them over. There's some money in them, too, to cover your expenses. Piketty puts the small packages in her reticule, and she and Ethelberta then walk with their arms around each other's waists. Thank you, Ethel. Well, thank you for delivering my poems to Mr. Julian. Did you like them? Yes. Although, naturally, I didn't understand all of the experiences which you mentioned. You live in another world, Ethel. Will the title of Lady Pethelwyn descend to you when your mother-in-law dies? Of course not. She's only a knight's widow. Now, be careful not to talk with anyone on the journey back, my dear. Especially if any man on the train tries to get familiar. Has anyone ever tried to pay attention to you yet, Piketty? Ethelberta smiles and peers into Piketty's face. No. Well, that is. I am in love with a man. Why? What has he done? That's just it. He hasn't done anything. Piketty, you mustn't let him see your interest. No man is ever interested in a woman if he has already got her heart for nothing. I know, Ethel. I know. She hangs and shakes her head. She looks up. Have you a lover? Well, I used to have one, and I recently saw him again. I must admit that I've never seen a man whom I hate less. He was in that carriage that drove over the hill. <gasps> a great lord, then? No, he's only a commoner, as yet. He was the musician that played last night. She smiles. It's that Mr. Julian to whom you delivered that book. Piketty gasps and puts her hands on her chest. Ethelberta stops. Are you all right, my dear? They sit on a log nearby. Oh, yes. I'm just, um, overtired. So, you... You have met Mr. Julian and gone walks with him? Oh, no. Nothing like that. I just accidentally had a few accidental words with him. I'm not actually attached, as such. Piggity nods. It is a delightful middling mind to be in. I, however, had gone way beyond it before I even realised I was in it. You must shake yourself free, my dear. Courage, mon brave. She smiles, stands up and holds out her hand to her younger sister. Are you feeling rested now, Piggity? Come on, let's collect some shells for the little ones before you have to get the train. Piggity smiles, takes her sister's hand and stands up. Mr Chickerell, the butler, Ethelberta's father, is setting out his writing materials on his little desk. There are the sounds of coming and going of people and faint carriage wheels outside. A footman comes in. Did you say the best silver in the silver cupboard and the second best in the back kitchen dresser, Mr Chickerell? For the third time, the second best in the main kitchen dresser. Ah, uh, yes. The footman goes out. Footsteps, a pause. Footsteps come back, door reopens and the footman's head reappears. And the main kitchen dresser is the one behind the big table? No, it's the one on the top shelf of the larder. Is it? Chickerel stands up angrily and shoves his chair back, so the footman hurriedly flies away. Chickerel sits down again, sighs and starts writing. My dear Ethelberta, the guests are just leaving the dinner party here at Mr Ney's uncle's house. The talk was all of your poems. You are famous, my dear. But the funny thing is that they all seem to think that you are older than you are. This letter is just to say that you are not to pressure Lady Petherwin to remove the rules on which you live with her. She is quite right. She cannot keep us, and to recognise us would do you no good, nor us either. We are quite content to see you secretly, since it is best for you. You will surely get some hard blows when you are found out, but your youth and health are your power, my dear. I'd better go now and supervise the tidying up after this dinner. 
I wish that I had a footman with half an iota of your common sense, Ethelberta. God bless you, your affectionate father, R. Chicoro. Christopher is seated at the piano playing a lyrical, slow, beautiful piece. Faith comes through and stands near to the piano. What is that piece, Christopher? You sound like you've finished it now. It's beautiful. Thank you. It's that poem, When Tapers Tall. He stops playing and looks up at her. Do you think those poems were Ethelberta's? I've no way of knowing for certain. Faith goes to the fire and sits down. Well, whosoever they were, I think that if they were a woman's, she must be rather, um, fast. You know? Christopher comes over and sits down too. He looks displeased. What? You mean bold or forward? Faith leans forward and puts her hand upon his knee. She smiles. Christopher, you're not... you're not falling in love again with that lady, are you? Christopher sits back in his armchair and smiles. Well, if I am, it's as well that I fall in love with someone whom I can't marry, isn't it? Faith frowns and looks into the fire. I don't like to hear you speak slightly of what poor father did. He still found mother, didn't he? Christopher picks up and starts reading his manuscripts nearby. Well, whoever I marry, Faith, there will always be a corner of my heart left for you. She smiles up at him. Christopher is walking along. Faith comes hurrying up to him with a filled basket, reticule and two brown parcels. Christopher takes the basket and parcels off her, and she takes his arm. Sorry I took such time, but the trooper is so slow. Have you been waiting long? No, I just went to the post office to post a copy of my music to Mrs. Petherwin. They walk back home, along the sand. Oh, you know that it's her now, do you? Yes, it was in the Wessex Reflector this morning. Apparently, she lives with her mother-in-law, Lady Petherwin, in Exonbury Crescent in London. I hope that she appreciates your song as much as I do. Well, it seems that tall tapers must be in her blood anyway, because apparently she was the Bishop of Solchester's daughter, left in straitened circumstances after he died. Good grief. Those were passionate effusions for a bishop's daughter. Christopher smiles and pats Faith's hand on his arm as they walk. Ethelberta is being seated at the piano and is chatting with a couple of ladies. Two men in their early thirties, Ney and his companion, are talking whilst leaning on the wall. There are about a dozen people in the room, in evening dress, having finished dinner and talking amongst themselves. Who is that damned pretty woman at the piano? Oh, that's Mrs. Petherwin, the poetess. Have you read her stuff, Ney? No. She's a widow, you know, and goes about with her mother-in-law, Lady Petherwin. Not a poetry reader myself. I admire her more reflective pieces. A middle-aged lady, Mrs. Belmain, leans over Ethelberta and rootles through several sheets on the piano. So do you like this version the best, dear? Another middle-aged lady interrupts, picking up some manuscript from the stand. This one is a manuscript. The others are actually published already. Ethelberta smiles. Oh, this latter song is by... Far the best. She takes the manuscript back, and then plays and sings the song when tapers tall. The room falls silent, listening. By jingle, the woman is magnificent. His companion raises his eyebrow. After the song, Ethelberta rises and joins Mrs. Belmain on her large sofa, who is talking with another middle-aged woman on her armchair next to her. We were just saying, dear, that far too many people indulge their servants. What do you think, Mrs. Petherwin? Ethelberta smiles. Oh, I think that someone should have written a pamphlet called The Shortest Way with Servants. Like the one the dissenters wrote. Ethelberta nods and tries to hide a roguish grin. Indeed, just so. She turns to take a glass of wine from a tray proffered by a footman. She smiles sympathetically at him. Ethelberta is in her dressing gown with her hair down. She is seated at her desk and lays down her pen. She takes up the letter which she has just written and reads it. 
Dear Mr. Julian, this is just to thank you infinitely. I played your piece this evening and everyone thought it wonderful. I prophesy great things of you. You must allow a woman of experience, however, to say that your talent will do you no good unless you mix it with a degree of ambition. I write to stimulate you to this. Also, I write to say that I will energetically avoid meeting you again, as there never can really be a friendship between man and woman who are not of one family. Some women might have written distantly and wept at the repression of their real feeling. But it is better to be more frank and keep a dry eye. Yours, Ethelberta. She sits back and <sighs> sighs wistfully. Lady Pethewin and Ethelberta are taking their walk. I asked you here, Ethelberta, as I wished to be out of our house with its servants before I expressed my disapproval of those, those poem things that I have just heard that you have written. Oh, I'm sorry, Mama. I didn't tell you of them in case you didn't like the idea of my publishing. You should have left them unwritten and showed more, more fidelity. What has fidelity got to do with it? My poor boy is dead now, and you, you, his relict, are showing levity. Levity? If I am to keep you, you should have some feeling of loyalty and show obedience to me, and, and, you should be mourning. I have shown obedience. For nearly four years. I wore black for two years instead of one, and then grey for one year instead of six months, and then lavender. There is only one thing that women of your sort are as ready to do as to take a man's name, and that is to drop his memory. My sort? We were only just out of childhood, Lady Pethewin. And he died on our honeymoon. I... I didn't go out into society for over two years. Those verses are ribald and demonstrate your unfeeling nature. Will you withdraw them? I am not ashamed of them and will not cancel them. I spent a great deal of work upon them, Mama. Lady Pethewin comes to a halt and regards Ethelberta severely. Then you may go home. You can go back. I shall continue my walk alone. You have greatly disappointed me, Ethelberta. Greatly. She turns and walks off, and Ethelberta stands staring after her, distressed. The Julians have just moved house into a small London flat. There is a large working man, a carter, just putting a box of chattels down on the floor, and Christopher comes out of the kitchen rolling his shirt sleeves up. Faith looks up from unpacking a vase at the man. That it then, miss? Yes, thank you. Please tell Mr Barkas, thanks for the delivery, and I'll send the payment on. The man touches his hat. Thank you, miss. I will. He goes out and Christopher starts selecting a box, which he starts to take through to the kitchen. Faith arranges her vase and photographs on a small stand table by the wall. Do you think you will get more pupils here, Christopher? In London? Of course. And also, I should be able to get a couple of organist appointments, which should help matters greatly. Are you coming out for a walk soon? Oh, there's far too much to do here, Chris. You go. Christopher nods and walks across the room with his box, in the direction of the kitchen. Not, um, going in the direction of Exonbury Crescent, by any chance. She smiles, provocatively. Christopher turns and shrugs nonchalantly. Just thought I might take a little look. Faith mm. turns back to her photos. Well, if a lovelorn lad can remember to bring some biscuits back, he can have some with his tea. I'm not lovelorn. Faith waves her fingers saucily. Ta-ta! Christopher frowns and goes into the back kitchen with his box. Christopher walks past the house and reads yet again the sign on the lower window of House to Let for Six-Month Period. He sighs with disappointment. Montage of Christopher walking past in different outfits and regarding the notice. Christopher finally walks past and notices with surprise that the sign is gone, the shutters are opened and he sees movement of people across the windows. Christopher knocks on the front door and the footman answers. Could I see Lady Petherwin, please? I am afraid that the house has been let to us in the Petherin's absence, sir. Oh, do you know where they are? The footman takes a card from the hall table nearby. Lady Petherin died last winter, sir, but I believe that Mrs. Petherin resides at this address. He hands the card over to Christopher. 
Christopher thanks him and walks back down the steps reading the card. Arrowthorn Lodge, Upper Wessex. Good grief, not far from Sandbourne. He heaves a big sigh and rolls his eyes. Oh, and now we're in London. and our dashing composer James Cox. And of course, we would like to thank our entrancing cast. Matthew Libri, Alex Davenport, Carl Wharton, David Mellor, Maria Chase, Mike Keane, James Makerpiece, Glenn Hanna, Lucy Kennedy, Stephanie Stephan, Catherine McCoolgan, Stephen Dean, Jenny Dyer, Caroline Joy, Thomas Purchase Rathbone, Jenny Bowden, Victoria Knowles, Mac McGuire and Nathan Walker. And last but not least, thank you to you too, dear listeners, without whom this would not be possible.